Hello and welcome to today's pattern. This one is my specialised small Betis nymph and I use it in quite specialised conditions. It's, it's one that I tend to use either in very hot weather, in low water conditions, or most of the time uh, it tends to be in cold water in winter. And as well as the fish having quite a low metabolic rate at that time of year, also any Betis or upwing nymph uh, species that are active at that time and available to be eaten, they tend to be quite early on in the life cycle. So definitely small flies are king in that situation. Have you been thinking about time flies but don't know where to start? We've got a free series of video tutorials that might interest you. A lot of YouTube videos jump straight in with the tie-in and there's really no time for a beginner to get a handle on what's going on. So we've created a series of individual step-by-step -step videos that cover the basics of fly tying. In each video you'll learn a different skill at your own pace. So for instance, we'll teach you how to tie on a thread on the hook. We'll teach you how to tie in materials on the hook. We'll teach you how to dub materials onto the thread and we'll cover several ways of whip finishing to finish the fly at the end of the tying. Once you've got a handle on these basics, you'll be able to follow along with YouTube fly tying videos like the one you're about to see. If this sounds like something that might interest you, click the link in the description and you can start your free fly tying tutorials today. In the true tradition of kids TV, I have some prepared materials here already. There's a size 20 uh, dry fly hook so it's a nice fine wire and a small pattern of, of, of hook that suits this fly very, very well. And onto that I've threaded a copper coloured 2mm tungsten bead. Again, to keep the proportions of that fly correct for, what, for the, the profile that we want to create. Because this is um, um, an upwinged fly, the, the silhouette is going to include uh, tail projections that stick out from the rear end of the fly. Now, I tend to use pretty much any feather fibre that I've got to hand and very often it'll just be bunches of, of hackle fibre, um, cock hackle fibre, sticking out the back of the fly. However, if you've got it and, and it's available to you, uh, the fibres that you find on um, Coq de Leon feathers or Gallows de Leon, if you're actually from that area, I believe, um, is absolutely ideal. Uh, not only is the, the barring and the, the colour on the fibre, very, very sort of accurate representation of the real thing. It's also very soft uh, and that helps to avoid the fly being pushed out of the fish's mouth as it's trying to grab it. You don't need to, I'm not going to be suggesting that you count the numbers of these fibres, you just want to create a silhouette with these tails sticking out the back end of the fly. Um, so and you'll see that obviously when we catch those in. I'm tying today with yellow uh, ultimate tying silk and I do quite like a yellow thread when I'm tying these olive patterns because the barring of the bodies on the natural nymphs as well as being very translucent you do get these kind of light and dark bands of uh, olives and yellows so it's nice to kind of pick that out and suggest that with the colour of the underbody and also the, the, the thread wraps that you get at the head of the fly. So I've caught that on, again as it's a GSP thread, I've given a reasonable bed of that so it binds onto the shank. And then it's a case of just selecting a few of these fibres. The length of these uh, feather barbs is quite substantial and that's very handy when you're tying. It helps you actually manipulate the, the, fe the feather fibres, which really helps when you're tying in these, these small hook sizes. And just checking that the, the tips of those feathers are matched up fairly well. And I like to kind of pinch and loop and, and catch those in right about halfway along the shank just before we get to sort of binding them in properly. And then I can see on this pattern I like to keep the, the tails really short and I can see there that these are a bit long so I'm just going to draw those through until I can set them to the length that I'm after. And then at that point, that lets me consolidate that position with a couple more wraps. And then for trimming them off, you can, if you like, you can use the bead just to help to sit those fibres up so that you can grab them. 
and then by doing that, by sliding that bead back along the hook shank away from the eye a little bit, it helps to make sure that the stub ends of those aren't so long that they project over the front of the bead when you catch those cut ends of feather fibre in. And you'll find that they'll lie pretty much straight flat up against the back of that bead. And that gives you a nice level um, basis, foundation to tie the rest of the body on. Because anything you do in the underbody of a fly really shows through on the surface, much more than you think actually. Uh, and so now we come to this quite funky, cool body material. Uh, it's the ultimate body rib. Uh, it's a D section, so it's, it's flat on one side and rounded on the other. Uh, this is the standard diameter and it's in olive. And because of its translucent colour, it's a great imitation for the bodies of many common Betis patterns, or Betis species, should I say. Um, this fly, as I've mentioned a couple of times already, is quite small. And what I'd like to do is to maintain that slim profile and not get too chunky and clunky with the, the actual the fatness of the body itself. This material is super stretchy, but something that helps you avoid creating too much tension in, in the turns of that material when you're trying to keep it nice and slim and pull it, is if you actually t deliberately take it beyond its normal elastic limit. And if you get a good grip on this stuff and keep stretching, it'll eventually break, but before it does so, you've already taken it past that elastic limit. And so you can see how far my hands are going apart here until it goes. What that then gives you is even when you leave it sort of limp like that, it's still got that reduced sort of diameter and that gives it closer to the, the condition of the material that I want to use for this particular pattern. While still having some elasticity, the closer you get or the further away you get from that broken end. So it's almost like created a, a tapered sort of piece of material. Crushing that in place with your thumbnail and catching that stub end in, actually just making sure that the right side of that's down. So ideally you want the flat side of it against the body. When you do stretch it, you do lose a little bit of the difference from you know the, the two sides of that body material. What I don't want to do is leave a great big stub of the, uh, the cut end. So I'm just pinching and looping quite accurately and then crushing down that cut end as much as I can with hard turns of thread. Then maintaining a bit of tension, it lets me come down in touching turns to the base of the tails there and then back up to the just behind the bead there. And again, because we've stretched that material now, it's not, you're not having to apply tons of tension to keep that body nice and slim and super translucent. And you've got those yellow shades sort of showing through from the underbody of the fly. Nip that in. You could probably see it took quite a degree of effort to, to break that material, so it is very robust. It's not quite as dense as wire and wire-bodied flies, so you've not you've got a slightly more natural sink rate. Um, but you do get that light transmission through it as well, so there's a lot of funky things going on with this. And apart from a whip finish and some little bits of cosmetic detail, that's that's pretty much it. So it's a, it's a very very simple fly. Um, but my word, it's you know, I've caught some fish on this particular person. So, what I'm going to do is come in with um, a little bit of uh, let's say scaffolding, there's a fixative here, fly fishing glue, dropping on a nice consolidated whip finish. Nipping that out, sliding it in, 
snugging down like that. Sever that off with a pushing movement. And then it's an extra little conceit, what I like to do, a lot of these Botus nymphs you get this counter shading on it where they get darker colours on the either on the thorax or on the back side of it and then the bellies are actually quite pale relative to the, to the back of a lot of these nymphs. Um, and so just coming in, supporting with my thumb and just give a stripe up the back and over the, the bead of that fly. And that looks great in the vise, but these are practical fishing flies. They're not just, um, you know, meant to look pretty until you actually come to fish with them. And if, if you fish with those with the pen just raw like that, it tends to come off the bead particularly pretty quickly. And so it makes sense just to, to use something, whatever your favoured sort of um, head cement or, uh, you know, UV resin, whatever it might be doesn't need to be hugely high build, um, just enough to create a little bit of a shell. So you don't need like dozens of, excuse me, dozens of coats of this material. You just need to put a little bit on and it protects everything, keeps it catching fish for, you know, much longer duration than just using the raw, um, the raw pen on its own. You don't want to stick it on with a yard brush. So what I tend to do is pull a little bit from the fibres of that brush and just dab it on gently. It's mainly the bead that needs the, the treatment but belt and braces and puts them along the back of the fly as well. And just doing that is enough of an insurance policy to make sure that that, that fly actually you know continues working for you for much longer. As the um, uh, the varnish actually evaporates, or the solvent from the varnish evaporates, that will shrink down a little bit as well, particularly just one coat of it. But that, in a nutshell, is one of my absolute favourite small baitist patterns. Mm -hmm.